chapter 6. So we'll be hopefully looking into what God might have for us this morning. <clears throat> but in way of just maybe if I may start an introduction here, certain scriptures, if I might say, are harder to understand than others. I think we can all agree with that. And I think we can, again, get something even from hard scripture. Someone said, like a good teacher, they start off with easy lessons and progress to harder ones. You know, God is the best teacher. We think we can, hopefully we can all agree. And so he, he knows what's best. He knows what we need, the, the hard understandings or the easy understandings of the scriptures and where we are in our walk. Sunday school, why have it? I mean, basically, why have Sunday school? Well, someone put it this way. Each moment you spend in God's word, will but deepen your understanding of what God wants you desperately to understand. So there's a purpose for Sunday school here. Jesus says, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. But whoso hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. You know, the more you want to know God's word, the more you're going to get. But if you don't want to know, even what little you do know, you'll soon forget. And God has a way of taking that little that you know away from your understanding. Sometimes if you're not in the word of God, you can't, I just can't remember that. Or I forgot what that, how that went because you're not regularly in the word of God. My title basically is, this is a hard saying. This is a hard saying. And if you're in John chapter 6, I take that from verse 60. Notice verse 60, John chapter 6. He said, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can hear it? Let's pray. Ask the Lord to meet with us. Lord, as we endeavor to look into your word, Lord, we ask and pray for the things that are written there. Lord, not only we're here, but we'll apply to our lives. And we ask and pray, Father, if things that might be difficult for us to understand, give us clarity this morning, Lord, of what you're trying to say, and um, we'll give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start in John chapter 6, known as verse 53. Starting in verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. At the start, let me say, John's gospel does not record many parables. Instead, he records Jesus' claim to deity, who God is, which are usually expressed in metaphors. So you won't find many parables, but you'll find many claims or many um, metaphors of who Christ is saying he is, God come in the flesh. John describes seven metaphors, the seven types of Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And he says, I am the vine. John describing Jesus in a metaphor type that he is something more than just a parable or example. He is God come in the flesh. These are not to be taken literally, but metaphorically. Now, we know there is a religion out there, and I'll touch, touch on it, that believes actually that the bread and the wine actually turns back into the body of Christ. But that's not the meaning. It's a metaphor. It's a type. What is clearly a figure of speech, or what we can call a metaphor, is taken literally, like I said, by the Roman Catholic Church. How they explain this, I want to bypass that. because That's not my topic. But point out, John chapter 6 has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. And they take this part and apply it to the Lord's Supper. It has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, which was not really instituted by the Lord until, or should I say, just before his crucifixion. So again, taking scripture out of context can confuse a lot of people. 
John chapter 6 cannot be used to support Catholic dogma. Or in other words, something they say that's true. It's not true, it's false. The Jews used expressions eat and drink in a figurative way to devote um, the operation of the mind or receiving truth. And again, I'm going to give you some examples, and that's where the scriptures come into play. But I want you, again, when you talk about, when the Jews talked about eating and drinking, it wasn't always physical food. It was a type of what I can get into my mind, what I can get into my hearing or my heart. But if you go to, again, Jeremiah, if you will, and again, scripture speaks louder than I, and that's why I want you to hear what scripture has to say. But Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15, if you notice verse 16, Scripture says, The words were found, and I did eat them. And thy words was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. See, it's, it's not literal food. It was God's word that he was eating, and it was joy to him. If you go Ezekiel, go to the right again, Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel makes somewhat of the same comment. Ezekiel chapter 2, notice verses 7 to 10. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they were here or whether they were forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of the book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was within, therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Point was, he gave him the word of God to eat. Again, as John says, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you might not have eternal life. He wasn't talking literally. It was a type of uh, words that they he, he would explain a little further as we go on. But there's one more I want to share with you, and we all kind of know it. It's in Revelation chapter nine, uh, chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 to 10. If you're not there, maybe you can just give me an ear. But Revelation chapter 10, verse 9 says, And I went unto the angel, and he said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall be in thy belly bitter. But... It shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Again, there's much more to be said just in that verse. But the idea I want you to see is sometimes when the Jewish people were talking about eating and drinking, it wasn't always literal food. It was the word of God they were supposed to be eating and drinking and taking in. Again, we might use words like, Boy, they devote, they devoured that book up. You know, we use it in our term. Boy, they devoured that book up. They didn't actually eat the book. They ate what they were saying. Or you're chewing on a piece of information. You know what I mean? You actually ain't chewing on a piece of paper. You're chewing on what someone told you. Or how could they swallow that outrageous lie? You know, these are terms that you would use to describe of eating something, but yet eating knowledge or words that somebody might have said. So as we go on, we will see that his flesh and drinking his blood symbolizes the act of believing in him for the salvation he offers through the sacrifice on the cross. So we're going to see this again. Notice verse again, if you're in John chapter 6, notice verse 54. It says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The only way to gain eternal life is to receive Christ himself as your Lord. I mean, these are things that we should know. Again, I'm not telling you something that you don't know. You need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Without him, you remain basically spiritual dead. You have no eternal life. Upon receiving him, though, the promise of resurrection at that last day is yours. The minute you receive Jesus Christ, you have the promise that one day that resurrection is coming to you. If it comes when we're still alive or if we come when we're dead, there's a resurrection day promised to you and I once you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
again, indicating to us here a last day. Resurrection day is coming. Yet when is the question? We know there's a day coming. When it is, we do not know. Even Jesus himself, he said, but of that day and that hour, knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son of Man, but the Father. Only the Father knows when that resurrection day is. Many people have opinions and like to give their knowledge of what they think, but when it all comes down to Scripture, no one knows that actual day. Notice verse as we go on in John chapter 6. Notice verses 55 and 56. He says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Here he says, they must not only eat his flesh, but drink his blood. Which could suggest the idea of not only his death, but, all, but the old way of living now, being dead to Christ. In other words, you might you don't even need to accept Christ, you need to be dead to that old way of life too. It's not just eating the flesh, but drinking the blood. Likewise, he says, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, a lot of people, I'm not telling you anything new. People will take him as Savior, but that Lord part is another story. They don't want that. People will take the bread, but they don't want to take the wine. And again, you have to be dead to the old nature. We all struggle in sins, and I'm not talking about, you know, backsliding and all these other things, but what I'm saying is there's more to just Receiving the bread. You have to take the bread and the wine. Notice verse 57, then, as we go on. In verse 57, he says, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Again, even as the Father and the Son, as one, and the Son lives for the Father, we are now one with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are now to live for Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, there's much more that could be said, but I think that's pretty simple on that, on that verse 57. Notice verse 58. In verse 58, it says, This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your father did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Again, it is... As Jesus is saying, I am the true bread, sent from the Father, sent from above. Take it or leave it. You can't get it any other way. You want to get to the Father? You have to eat the bread. I am the true bread. You must come to me to get to the Father. Again, the time had come to begin willingly, separating the chaff from the wheat. God's now good. Jesus is bringing forth there's and as we'll see, there were many following him, but now it's the divide. Who's actually for him? Who's actually not? Who's true? Who's false? Those that are true, those that truly believe, um, he's going to separate the true from the false, basically, as I had a little more to say there, but that would be good. Notice verse 59 as we go on then. Again, verse 59. These things say he in the synagogue, as he taught in Capernaum. In the synagogue, where people came to hear the scriptures, but even in churches, decisions still have to be made. Again, a lot of people will come to church, but a decision still has to be made. When you hear the message, a decision still has to be made. You know, and we know altars are, altars are given, or altar calls are given at the end of the service, but I, the ideal is many people hear the scriptures and they walk out with any decision. You have to make a decision to either accept or to reject. And again, often by what this pastor preaches, we have to make that decision. We might not always come to the altar, but you're going to make a decision. Either I'd like that message or I'm going to obey that message or what was true. Or you say, no, I don't believe it. I'm going to make, you know, just deny it, neglect it, whatever. But again, notice verse 59. It started within the church, in the synagogue. Now we go back to verse, now we're 60, the, the, the heart of the text, I guess you could say, the message. Verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? 
It's difficult. It's understand. I can't understand it. What are you trying to say? The words his disciple. First of all, it needs to be pointed out. The word disciples is used here, again, in various ways. It does not always refer to the 12. So when he's saying this statement, it's not talking exactly to the 12 or even to true believers. It may refer to merely curious or uncom uncommitted people following Jesus at this time. You know, it's like he, I'm a disciple of someone, I'm following them, but that doesn't mean I'm actually obeying them or um, agreeing with everything they say. And that's why that he had many disciples that were following him, but they weren't all on the same page, or they were all, as we'll see, they weren't all going to follow him in the end. Again, a disciple, please understand, just because you come to church, just because you're a Christian, doesn't make you a Christian. Okay? And that's basically what it is. Just because you're called a disciple doesn't mean that you're a disciple of Christ. It just means that you're following someone. But to actually make that decision then to receive them is a different story. That's where you go one step further, as we'll see in the lesson here. The second thing, this is a hard saying. Sometimes Jesus' words do not make sense at first reading. And there is a good reason for that. Those that lack spiritual ears to hear or eyes to see, again, will murmur, they'll complain, or just turn back. If you don't understand, many people just say, ah, I give up, I'm not going to church anymore, or complain, or, or murmur underneath their breath in some way. It may be that those who really want to know must work diligently to understand God's word. And why it is definitely worthwhile, very often it is it is not easily achieved. You know, for us, it's easy. We can just go online, we got commentaries, but those before us, they actually had to dig into the scriptures and to, they didn't have the conveniences that we had. So if they really wanted to know the truth, they had to study, they had to dig into it. Today, we take it for granted, you know? I'm too, too much for granted, if I may say. So if you really want something, you got to, if it's worthwhile, you're going to go for it. You're going to put yourself into it. You're going to dig a little further to understanding what that verse said. What did Christ actually mean instead of just taking it at face value? Again, you can come to the church and pastor can tell you something, but how do you know it's true unless you dig or search in to it to see if it's true for yourself? Don't always take what someone says for face value. Again, we know there's, there's people that have good credibility. You know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't trust sometimes because sometimes we don't have the, the, um, the time to search and search and search where they might be able to give six, seven, eight hours of their time. We might only be able to give one hour. But they also, again, they put that time into to searching what the scriptures actually say. The Bible says, study though to show thyself approved unto God, unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. We've got to divide what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not true. Notice verse 61 as we go on here. Verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Now the Lord knew their thoughts. And he said, does this offend you? The Lord made himself greater than Moses. Does this offend you? He claimed to come down from heaven. Does this offend you? He claimed to be the one with God. Does this offend you? He was pointing to his death as the way of life. Does this offend you? They couldn't get it. It did offend them. Their murmuring might have been something like this. This is offensive. Who can listen to this kind of talk? He's gone mad. He doesn't know what he's saying. You know, who knows what they might have said underneath or murmuring amongst themselves. You know, and again, we have the whole scriptures. We see the beginning from the end. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were actually, and again, you had to basically truly be a believer, a follower, and have that faith to follow Christ. And they did not. They could not comprehend this hard saying. Or these hard things. So they basically said, ah, this guy's gone mad. Who is he? Yeah, well, here today, gone tomorrow, whatever, you know, however you want to phrase it. But no, Jesus made no attempt to clarify or to simplify his meaning to those who were offended. 
He didn't explain it. Okay, you don't believe me? That's fine. He had said, I may, he had said, this was divinely designed to separate. Or I should say, one has said, this was divinely designed to separate his true followers from those who were just merely curious. We don't know the mind of God, and God might have put this in there just to find out, okay, how many are here just curious, and how many really want to know the truth? And so he was dividing them now with hard sayings. You really want to know, you're going to stick with it. The Apostle John would later write in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And so he's trying to separate those that are with us, those that are not with us. And we saw in verse 60, many of the, therefore those disciples, those that were curious, turned back. Again, some may even forsake the Bible itself because it offends them. I'm not going to pick up that Bible anymore. It speaks of my sin. I get convicted every time. That's basically what it does. It convicts you. But I mean, so they basically, they see the Bible offensive. Ah, who wrote the Bible? Ah, come on, you can't believe the Bible. They're offensive to it because it offends them. You know, they go to church, be involved in certain events, they hang around with other Christians, and you can do these things and still not be a disciple or a follower of Christ. Again, coming to church, being involved in certain events, going to um, other um, um, events at other churches. I'm trying to think of the word, but I can't remember. But hanging at conferences, hanging around with other Christians does not mean then you are one of Christ. Amen. Judas could be the best example. Again, but all too willing and all too soon, they will forsake all that God has for them because they were a little offended. That sin, that offended me, I'm leaving. You know, for us, maybe, again, you're here in Sunday school, it's a little different. You're a little more solid. But if you get new believers in, and they're not saved, they're on, they're on their fence, or if they're not, um, if they're saved and they're young, if you come straight forward with them and tell them the truth, they might be offended, and they might just get up and leave. But we, basically, those that come to Sunday school are a little more solid. We can take a little more hard preaching than the rest of the, the morning service crowd. I should say. Notice verse then again in John chapter 6, notice verse 62. He says, what? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now he asked them what they would think of if he ascended into heaven before their very eyes. What if all of a sudden I was just taken up? implying that even that sight would not pierce the dullness of their heart. Even if they seen Christ going up at that moment, they still wouldn't believe. They still wouldn't believe. He warned them that their understanding was limited to only earthly thinking, which would never be able to grasp spiritual truth. And the Bible is a spiritual book. It's written by men through the Spirit. So who's actually writing the scriptures? It's the spirit using man as a pen. And we have God's word. That's why many today can't comprehend hard sayings from the scriptures. And many of them can't comprehend scripture at all because it's spiritual. You must be born again to understand the things of God. Now, when you first get saved, there are some basic things you can understand. But the harder things, maybe the more difficult things, um, it's a spiritual book. You have to be born again. Jesus' words, again, were spiritual. And he held the key to eternal life. Jesus, again, he did not ascend back to heaven at that time. His mission was not yet accomplished. So those who were offended felt confirmed in their indignation and their anger or uh, murmuring. Yeah, he's not going up. See, I know he was not going to go up. He's all talk. And so they thought they were justified in their murmuring against Christ. Who is this guy making all these claims, you know? He's a coming goer, I guess, or however you want to say it. People today say, where is the promise of his coming? Scripture tells us. 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there is that resurrection day coming for those that have received the promise of Christ, received Christ. Here, it indicating people today are spiritually blind. They are just basically spiritually blind. That is why it's so hard sometimes when you're trying to witness to someone, when you use the scriptures, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use the scriptures, and you should use scripture, but it's sometimes you have to reason with them on a conscience level, get their conscience pricked in some way, and hopefully that will bring them to the scripture. But people today are spiritually blind. What they think of the scriptures and of Christ, that's just a book, that's just a good man. That's just a book, a lot of stories, a lot of you know, nice little fairy tales. Keeps us entertained, you know. That's what the Bible does. We come, we hear a story, we get a little clap, a little laughter, maybe a little conviction. That's all it is. Again, and Jesus, he was a good man. Did he really rise from the dead? Who said he did? Where's the proof, you know? Did he ever come back? I never seen him. You know, it's all these because, again, it's a spiritual book. And it all comes down to faith. It's faith. Everybody has faith in something. You're going to believe in something, you know. Some people believe in the devil, believe it or not. Again, even when the rapture takes place, a great many will still not believe. Even when that day comes, when the Christians are raptured up, there'll still be many that will not believe. And they'll make all kinds of excuses, what those excuses are, I don't know. Notice again, as we go now to verse 63 in John. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Kind of almost what I just said earlier, but Jesus' entire message was a spiritual one. And this is what they were completely missing. They did not see the spiritual side. They only saw the flesh, the earthly side. Flesh and blood, what do you mean? That's food? How can someone eat someone's flesh and blood? Is he going to commit cannibalism? Is he going to kill himself? I mean, their minds could have went many different directions. Limiting, again, they were limiting understanding to what is fleshly and earthly and never, never led to the, again, eternal or to the spiritual. And that's where it comes down once again. You must be born again. You can argue with someone all you want about something from the scriptures, but it all comes down. If they're not born again, you could be just hitting yourself with a rock in your head because they first have to get saved before they can see the spiritual things of, of, of the scripture. Jesus said, again, in this verse, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. Every time you come to hear the word of God, I just can't emphasize that enough. When the scriptures are read, the spirit is speaking. Now, I know illustrations and other things, those could be man trying to help you understand. But again, when it comes to the scriptures, the spirit is speaking to you in some form or fashion. Jesus here was referring to the Holy Spirit as the giver of true life. This is what the crowd considered to be a hard saying. Yet it was actually the very truth about gaining eternal life brings to mind, again, the Lord's words to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Again, which one are you? Flesh or the spirit? You have to be born again. I heard this just coming in, or maybe I heard this a day ago, and I thought, there's only two types of races in the earth. There's the saved and the unsaved. Those are the only two races. Believer, the unbeliever. That's the only race that God sees. And you know, in a sense, you can only become on the saved side through the Spirit. You must be born again through the Spirit. Again, in verse 63, we read, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Speaking of eternal life. Again, many... I hopefully many would say, show me in the scriptures where I can have this eternal life. You know, and that's what we do hopefully when you share with someone. Let me show you what the Bible says, not what I say. Man can persuade man, but the Spirit of God persuades, or how I don't want to use the persuades, can get man saved. 
And so again, it all comes, the words are the life. Brother, we, I think we got a visitor, Brother Hall, a young lady, I don't, I never remember seeing her. But anyhow, going on here. The Lord's words are life-giving. They can quicken or, and make alive. Put the life, again, let me read that again, I kind of got sidetracked there. The Lord's words are life-giving. They can quicken or make alive. But the, I'm still kind of sidetracked here, sorry. But the life of Jesus put in, into a death persuades spirit, giving him eternal life. I kind of messed that up. I don't know what happened there. I got sidetracked, but let me go on here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For many, the Bible, Jesus' words are hard sayings to understand. But the Bible is not just, again, an ordinary book. Again, hopefully what I was trying to get across. The Bible is a spiritual book. It is God-breathed. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it's literally God's breath to you and I. Many will begin to, un many will begin to under only upon the beginning. Many will only begin to understand only upon being born again. Yes. For then, as you, for then you will grow. The Spirit will re reveal these hard things to you. Maybe by your own studying or by another or maybe by someone that's a little learned. And they will help you understand the hard sayings of the scripture. Let's go to 1 John real quick. 1 John chapter 1. Sorry, I kind of got a little sidetracked there and mumbled. But let me just give you what the scriptures say again. Always go back to the scriptures. You, feel like <laughs> you can't go wrong. 1 John chapter 1. Notice verses 26 and 27. 1 John chapter 1, and that's probably not it. Boy. <laughs> now, it was 1 John, so let's even go on a little further. Is some leading too much Try, 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 da, 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 da. try verse 2. I don't know if that's it, but we'll find out. He says, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it is that taught you, he shall abide with him. That is the verse that I'm looking for. But in verse 26, again, notice verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Some were being led astray in their thinking from the truth. That's what is the context here. In verse 27, he says, But the anointing, the Holy Spirit, which ye have received of him, abideth in you. If you're saved, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, abides in you. And you need not any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. The Holy Spirit not only helps us to know the truth from error, but will also help us to understand those hard sayings. One reason so many in different, are in different religions because they're confused, they're led astray, and that basically they don't have to believe in the Holy Spirit to see the error from, from, um, from truth. They don't believe the Spirit in part of the Trinity being God's head, and thus they are led astray. Notice verse 64 as we go back to John. John chapter 6, verse 64. I'll get my bearings back. <laughs> In John chapter 6, verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. This verse basically cuts to the heart. Among Jesus' followers were those who heard the words and witnessed the miracles, but did not believe. Again, fast forward today. You could say people come to church, they hear the word of God, they talk the language, but do they really believe? As hard as that might be to swallow, and we might not want to believe it to be so, there are people in churches that are not saved. We do not know Jesus knew and knows who they are. 
Jesus knew ahead of time who was going to remain faithful to him and who would not. Now, if that isn't enough, Jesus takes it one step further. Here he mentions Judas. Again, notice verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who were that believe not and who should betray him. Judas would be the one, and Jesus knew him. Let me read verse 65. And he, and he said, Therefore say I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given to him of the Father. Again, leaving the church where Christ is taught is one thing. Bad-mouthing the church and following of Christ and and, and, and boy, boy, I'm so stuttering here and I can't catch my tongue right now. Leaving the church where Christ is taught is one thing. But mouthing the church, the followers of Christ, and Christ himself is somewhat of a betrayal. And that's what he's saying. It's one thing just to leave. But they weren't just leaving. Now they were bad-mouthing. And that's another step that he takes upon them. In verse 65, again, I'll read it again. Verse 65. Therefore, and he said, Therefore, say unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father. The Lord draws a line between those who seek and, and those who seek him and those who are not going to seek him. And those who are farther, farther from the Son. Some has drawn to Christ for his miracles. They have drawn to Christ because of the miracles that he's done. They were expecting the kingdom to be established on earth as some as, as some as they as some as they did. Some thought that the kingdom was going to come right away. Some today come under the pure pressure of the preaching. They feel they need to get saved just because there's pure pressure that the preaching brings along with it. Again, nothing more. It's in those heads or minds. I'm really messing this up here, folks. I'm going to have to read this again. So I apologize. I'm going to go back and review 65. We're going to close it there. I apologize. I've lost the chain of thought there because my notes somehow are not on the page that I wish to bring them for to you this morning. So we're going to end there. We're going to pick it up next week, 65. We'll finish up the rest of the verse. Hopefully I won't stumble or mumble. Hopefully I'll be on track. If there's any questions, comments, I apologize, but let's pray. Father, once again, just thank you for the opportunity for your word to speak. Again, Lord, having a hard time this morning, don't know why. Um, just ask and pray something might have been said, might refresh the memories of, the, of those that came here. They came to hear from you, Lord, and I pray that you um, just give them a special blessing in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen.